We were a metal band. We did this because we loved it. There was that love of being able to coincide the genres and show that we, we can do a lot of cool things too alongside with what we have. I really remember like fall of 81, I had started college at St. John's University. All I listened to at that point in time was Iron Maiden and Run DMC. I mean, it was, it was equal. I, I, both moved me the same way. Rock, metal, punk, hip hop, there was, a, in, particularly in New York, there was a strata where there was a lot of commingling. There was that word crossover. There was a kind of outlaw camaraderie. But what I started noticing, perhaps due to college radio, that more people started listening to different kinds of music. You started seeing Run DMC shirts around. Growing up where I grew up, hip hop, well, I'm sure it was, it was huge on the East Coast too, but it was becoming this thing that you had to listen to. And I think that's to do with the changing of the times, young people not carrying the separations made by maybe what their parents were just you know these people live here and we live there where another generation went like no man we're just not gonna carry all that because it makes no sense it's no fun and at the end of the day it's, it's hateful I started to notice maybe later in the 80s, earlier in the 90s, when you start seeing public enemy shirts at your shows and public enemy shirts at metal shows. It wasn't until Bring the Noise came out with Public Enemy where I was like, hallelujah. I grew up listening to WABC. I grew up listening to, you know, metal. That was just like, I went to a high school where, you know, it was predominantly white in Long Island. I was bused from my black town to this school. And so we were exposed to everything that they were listening to from the Zeppelins to the Bostons. And the Frampton was in my high school year and, you know, Jackson Brown. So somewhere in the middle of that was, was the metal mix. But we all came up in this, in that New York zeitgeist. And that is um, a big deal. The rock guys had the venues figured out even on Long Island, but they were just live bands that was kicking ass. And we wanted to emulate that. We wanted to emulate it so much. We wanted the hip hop to, to follow the metal scene on Long Island, but in our own way. Because we, you know, we, we felt that DJs and MCs should have logos too. Every time I would open up a Good Times or Island Ear, I would see this band and they would have a logo, whether you knew them or not. Because that's where the Public Enemy logo came from, which kind of turned Scott Ian on as being kind of, you know, a legitimate, you know, rap marketing, you know, um, aspect. Scott um, wore the Public Enemy shirt on stage a lot. If you notice in the, some of the old pictures. We got signed to Def Jam. And our uh, publicist, uh, the Svengali, the main guru, Bill Adler, had all kinds of cutouts from the, the British papers, Enemy and Melody Maker, on his desk. And um, it happened to be, I looked at, at this picture where I saw this guy wearing a public enemy shirt playing in front of like 100,000 people. I got an advanced copy of Yo Bum Rush the Show. Earlier we had friends at Def Jam. Like, you know, they were just like, wait do you hear this next thing. This guy Chuck D's got the heaviest voice in rap music. He's the best rhymer ever. I was obsessed with it. Like, Public Enemy for me, I was obsessed with it as much as I've ever been obsessed with any other band. 
Oh yeah, I heard of Anthrax, of course. The scenes were all kind of interlocked with each other. So this was a guy who was from the area with a band from the area wearing a Public Enemy shirt. I was blown away. It was actually the, the inspiration for writing Brain of Noise. Chuck put the, the, uh, the, the line Anthrax for Anthrax in, 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 in the song. Public Enemy song, Brain of Noise, is actually a song that was featured for the soundtrack Less Than Zero, which came out in November of 1987 when we submitted that song. And inside the third verse of the lyric um, is like the wax is for anthrax, you know, meaning that, you know, hip hop and rap music and rock and thrash, we were all the same. I couldn't believe Public Enemy just name checked us in their song, you know, in a, in a good way. <laughs> like we weren't getting called out for being assholes. We ended up meeting each other. We became friends uh, because of our mutual friends at Def Jam. What few baseball hats and few uh, sports insignia teams were available, Scott wore those, those uh, he wore those teams like a hip hop dude, you know? Pretty sure the first time we met, Chuck came to see us at the Beacon Theater, I think in December of 87, when we were on that headline run where we had Exodus and Celtic Frost with us. I don't know if they came together, but Chuck and Vernon were definitely in the dressing room hanging out with us. And I, I'm pretty sure that's the first time we actually met. And we hit it off, you know, right away. It was just like, a, just lots of mutual love affair. You know, just, it was, it was great. We've, we've been friends ever since. He's, he's one of the best, man. And it was so great meeting Chuck for the first time because he was just like, makes you feel like you've known him forever. This is how great of a person Chuck D is. There's this uh, award show in New York way back when. It's called, it was at the Beacon Theater in New York. So Public Enemy was there and Anthrax, um, I think we were, we were up for an award or we were winning an award or something. So I had to go down to represent us because nobody else was in town. We get the award, all that stuff. I say goodbye and Chuck and Ola. So I go down to the garage near the Beacon Theater, go down and my fucking car decides not to start. Right? It's stuck. It's dead. My fucking car is dead. It wouldn't go. So I'm embarrassed. I'm stuck. I'm frustrated. I want to get the fuck home, right? Who do I see come up next to me? He goes, hey, what's up, Frank? It's Chuck. Chuck D. He goes, what's wrong? You got problems? I have the hood up and everything. I'm trying to see. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with the engine, right? So he goes, all right, you know what? Leave this here. I'm driving you home. I said, no, you're not driving me home. That's way out of your way. He goes, I'm driving you home. And he says hello to my wife and he says, come on, let's go. Brings me in this car, dude. He drives me all the way home that's completely out of his way. Uh, drives me to the front door of my house and gets me home safely. And that's that's what kind of great person Chuck D is. And I'll never forget that. Aside from being one of the best voices and, and obvious rappers in the world and icons, but the other side is he's just a great person. It was totally Charlie and uh, Scott's idea on Bring the Noise. I had already said, hey, you guys want to cover it? Because they asked, can they, can I, you know, cover it with them? And um, they were pretty much like, look, look, we want to try to make a version here. And I was like, well, Bring the Noise already was a hit in our field. And I totally didn't get that. They wanted to flip it and, and, and make it go totally metal. Scott was very, very vocal about doing Bring the Noise. I thought it was a great idea because they're a heavy band. Uh, Charlie thought it was a great idea too. He was, a, he was a fan. He wanted the guitars to do some of what the horns were doing. For me, I just wanted to beef it up with like fast kick and just just beef the song up. Metal, um, rock, and rap colliding together. You know, the fact that um, the Bomb Squad, you know, when they when they did uh, the Nation of Millions, you know, they sampled Slayer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for she watched Channel Zero. I mean, you don't need me, you know? And they say, like, yes, we do need you, Chuck. Where are you, you know? Chuck's tone is so heavy. It's like Black Sabbath tuning down. That's how Chuck D's voice is. But they took the music and built around the vocal, which was unprecedented. I wish I could lay claim to making that happen, but it was totally Scotty and Charlie making me fit. And before we even toured, we had, we had appeared on the stage at the Garden. That was the night that 
we decided we were going to have Chuck and Flav. We asked those guys if they wanted to come down. And then I also asked them if they would want to do Bring the Noise as an encore with us. And they said, yeah, of course. And so we just figured, man, what a night, you know, to premiere this. And as great as our show was, uh, you know, hitting that stage and feeling the love from the audience that night as the New York band, you know, playing the garden. And on a night where every band had a great show, when Chuck and Flav came out and we kicked in to Bring the Noise, and it was like someone just like a lightning bolt like Zeus threw a lightning bolt down through the ceiling of the garden and hit like literally zapped everyone because the energy all like even as high as it was it's that it literally blew the roof off when those guys came on stage not that we ever had a doubt that that song was going to be something but we just performed it in front of like 16,000 hardcore metal fans and they lost their shit. That quickly opened up the floodgates for so many things to follow, including the Judgment Night soundtrack. You had to think about these guys too. They broke the barrier doing all that stuff. And that was a New York thing too. I mean, they were very into the Beastie Boys, Run DMC, and once they got into that side of things and the public enemy, you know, bring the noise, it was like, they really broke barriers with that, man. And I feel that they should have gotten a bit more credit on it, you know what I mean? because they, they just changed the whole game. I'm not sure that's worth credit at all. Gary King, I love, but sometimes he's such a grouch. Like the thing is, does he not remember he played on a fucking Beastie Boys record? You know, like take a little credit too, dude. Like <laughs> you soloed on two songs that made me a hip hop head forever. That's fair, it's still a little too much hip hop for me but you know I'm more of a purist and I'm not picking on them or picking on anybody that hip hops their music. I can relate that to when we finally did a song with Ice-T and I turned down that soundtrack for the longest time dude. I said like, I don't want to do it and then one day my manager said and he knew he had me he said what about Ice-T and I went that's not the stupidest thing I heard come out of your mouth and I said, you know, Ice T's a metalhead, and we can pull this off, and it'll be unique, and it'll be awesome. And it was. For me, the Judgment Night soundtrack is the ultimate co compilation of when metal meets hip hop. But if it wasn't for Bring the Noise being so accepted, I was open to it. I was when they did that. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard because I was already into the Beastie Boys and I was into Run DMC and I was into Public Enemy. And I feel to this day they don't get the respect or appreciation for being that band that had the the, the nerve to do that to cross metal and hip hop. Cross, you know, people people flash on Aerosmith. Yes, there was Run DMC and Aerosmith. Yes, we, we cannot forget that one. But that was kind of just cute, but it didn't really do much. And the difference was is that here you had a rock band covering a rap record, where Run DMC the year before was a rap band covering a rock song. And they, they were anti-racist. Like the fact that they did that and then the fact that they did songs like Schism and then they, they touched on it in other songs, where I was, as I was becoming more socially um, aware and more, you know, politically aware and growing, you know, growing up, um, they were there too. I think a lot of people forget, or they forget to name check certain things that happened. So that's where Anthrax made the history. It's like, how, go figure, like, how dare y'all? Like, what the hell? You guys are covering a rap song and taking it into the stratosphere. And before you know it, it became this another thing, you know? <laughs> and then it became a tour. We had a day off and Chuck flew in to do it. And we were on the bus and talking. And we were talking like, well, what, why don't we do what Run DMC didn't do since, you know, we were shooting a video saying, well, well let's tour. That tour was pre-Lollapalooza. We did Lollapalooza before Lollapalooza. That truly is an alternative bill we wanted to put together an eclectic show. That was obviously, it's what we were going for. It became this amazing tour that in my, my eyes, it raised it again, another level of, of how different Anthrax is because we can't just be 
confined. The opening band was this rap group called Young Black Teenagers, and uh, and then Primus, and then PE, and then us. Uh, we were big Primus fans, and just felt, wow, man, what a perfect band to put on because they don't sound anything like us. They don't sound anything like PE. They don't sound anything like anybody except for Primus, and Primus was great. They they crushed every night. Huge. Huge Primus sucks chance, just like you would, you know, like you would expect them to have at their shows. We just really wanted to put on a show that no one had ever seen before. That was one of my favorite tours of all time, touring with those guys. I, I, I loved it. I watched every night uh, because it was just that special. I was watching. I always watched their sound checks, Public Enemy, and and the stage moves they did. They had these great stage moves they did, like. Uh, and I always wanted to learn them, so I would learn them during the sound check. And I love that we did that, and people were worried about that tour and how it would be. Oh my God, is it is going to be a race thing going on there? Of course not. Fans understood how what it was and how great it was, and they all came out, and it was great. It's not what maybe we had expected or had thought would happen, like where, oh, well, it's us in Public Enemy, so it's going to be 50% white kids, 50% black kids. So we looked at it as, man, what a great thing if we could get like a generation of black kids, you know, start listening to metal. You know, we play the first show and it's like a 98% white audience. It was like that the first couple of gigs. And I, I said to Chuck, I said, D would you have expected more black people to come to these shows? He said, oh, no, no, Scotty. He said, if we're out on a rap tour, yeah, then we have our black audience. But if we're out on a rock tour, we, we have a bigger white audience. Millions of white kids that got into rap music in the 80s. So when PE was on, from the stage to halfway back was their people. And from halfway back to the back of the room, whatever it is, was our people. And then when PE would be done, you could literally watch the two crowds like switching places. But I, I, I will say this, people didn't leave. We didn't lose the audience, like, which, to me, it was really great. People were really coming out to see something different and to experience something different. And when we toured together, Public Enemy learned how to turn it up to notches because our notches were heavy in the rap world. We had to really kind of turn it up two notches to keep up, not only with metal, but thrash metal, speed metal, and anthrax. It was great. I love when Chuck says Anthrax, Public Enemy, it was shrapnel. I, I, I love when he says that because it's like, it's exactly what it is, you know? Those shows were packed from, from 20 minutes after Doors until the last, Flav, Flav would get up on Charlie's drum kit at the end of the night. We'd bring the noise, we'd be done. And he... You couldn't stop Flavor from playing, playing drums. Yo, check this out. He was just, he was just, well, he was good. He played, he played some fun stuff. He would be up there rocking a the beat for 15 minutes. Like the lights, the house lights are on and he's just up there banging away. Um, yeah, it was, uh, again, what a run, man. Every show was amazing on that tour. I love the backstage stuff we had. We had some of the most fun times on that tour. Flavor was in our dressing room just about every night playing Charlie's drum set he had back there. He was just jamming. It was fun as hell, man. God, so much happened after that, you know, and it was crazy. A lot of bands got careers too. We, we never intended to take it any further, but if we felt that if we couldn't top it, then we were not going to touch it. It was great. Um, you know, I, obviously at that point in time, I, I thought there was a vibe going on too. I mean, I hate to say it, but at that point I knew something was up. The band was acting a little weird towards, towards me. So I, I think they, they were up to something. So I had mixed motions, but the most of it, 90% of it, or say 85% of it was awesome. No, nothing else but fun there. I, I'm so happy that I got to do it. I think it was awesome.